the War of the Breton Succession was a conflict between the Counts of Blois and the Montforts of Brittany for control of the Duchy of Brittany, then a fief of the Kingdom of France. It was fought between 1341 and the 12th of April 1365. The Dukes had both a historical and ancestral connection to England and were also heirs of Richmond in Yorkshire, a Duke Arthur II of Troyes, near married twice, first to Mary of Limoges, then to Yolande of Troyes, Countess of Montfort and the widow of King Alexander III of Scotland. From his first marriage he had three sons, including his heir, John III, and Guy, Count of Penteffley, from Yolande. Arthur had another son, also named John, who became Count of Montfort. John III strongly disliked the children of his father's second marriage. He spent the first years of his reign attempting to have this marriage annulled and his half-siblings bastardised. When this failed, he tried to ensure that John of Montfort would never inherit the duchy. Since John III was childless, his heir of choice became Joan of Penthievre, La Boutuis, daughter of the younger brother Guy. In 1337, she married Charles de Blois, the second son of a powerful French noble house and the son of the sister of King Philip VI of France. But in 1340, John III reconciled himself with his half-brother and made a will that appointed John of Montfort the heir to Brittany. On the 30th of April 1341, John III died. His last words on the succession uttered on his deathbed were, For God's sake, leave me alone and do not trouble my spirit with such things. Most of the nobility supported Charles of Blois, so if John of Montfort was to have any chance, he was dependent upon swift action before organised resistance could be made. John quickly took possession of the ducal capital, Nantes, and then seized the ducal treasury of Limoges. By the middle of August, John of Montfort was in possession of most of the duchy, including the three principal cities of Nantes, Rons and Vannes. Up to this point, the succession crisis had been a purely internal affair. But to complicate things further, the Hundred Years' War between England and France had broken out four years earlier, in 1337. In 1341, there was a truce between the two countries, but there was little doubt that hostilities would be renewed when the truce ended in June 1342. Thus, when rumours reached Philip VI of France that John of Montfort had received English agents, the French crown naturally took a more direct interest in the situation. Charles of Blois became the official French candidate. Whatever had been his original intentions, John of Montfort was now forced to support Edward III of England as King of France. Edward III of England was bound by truce not to take any offensive action in France. Nothing in it, however, hindered France from subduing rebellious vassals. In November, after a short siege and defeat at the Battle of Champcontreux, John of Montfort was forced to surrender at Nantes by the citizens. He was offered safe conduct to negotiate a settlement with Charles of Blois, but when this led nowhere, he was thrown into prison. It now fell upon John's wife, Joanna of Flanders, to lead the Montfortist cause. Deeming her possessions in the East indefensible, she set up headquarters at Hennebon in Western Brittany, but was driven into Brest and besieged. The siege being broken by the arrival of an English army under the Earl of Northampton at the naval battle of Brest. In Paris, it was feared that Edward III would land at Calais 
once the truce ran out. The major part of the French army was therefore withdrawn. In late November, Edward III arrived with his army at Brest. He almost at once marched against Vannes. The siege dragged on and a French army was assembled to meet him. But on the 19th of January 1343, before any major engagements could be fought, the two kings agreed upon a new truce. Vannes was taken into papal custody. With John of Montfort in prison, his son and infant and his wife recently gone mad. The places under Montfort's control were in practice administered from London, with a large permanent English garrison at Brest. The truce was to last until the 29th of September 1346, with the hopes that in the meantime the disputes between the two kingdoms could be permanently settled. But in Brittany it made little difference. The truce found the two kings and their followers, but Charles of Blois continued claiming to be fighting his own separate war and was therefore not bound by any truce. The brutal, small-scale fighting continued at the same pace. In Paris, John of Montfort was released from prison on the 1st of September 1343 in return for a huge bond and a promise to stay on his estates in the east. The English coastal garrisons held firm, but the Montfortist party continued to crumble. They had some successes, such as the expulsion of the papal custodians from Vaughan, but with no unifying leadership, mostly they were reduced to pleading for men and money from London. To hamper communication between Brest and Vaughan, Charles of Blois laid siege to Quimper in early March 1344. The city fell by assault on the 1st of May, and as usual at that time, this meant the slaughter of civilians in huge numbers, estimated between 1,400 and 2,000. The English prisoners were held for ransom, but the Breton and Norman captives were dispatched to Paris, where they were executed for treason. During the summer and autumn, the Montfortist party fell apart. Even those who had been John of Montfort's staunchest allies now considered it futile to continue the struggle. It therefore mattered little that in March 1345, John finally managed to escape to England. With no adherence of his notes of his own, he was now little more than a figurehead for English ambitions in Brittany. Edward III decided to repudiate the truce in the summer of 1345, a full year before it was due to run out. As part of his larger strategy, a force was dispatched to Brittany under the joint leadership of the Earl of Northampton and John of Montfort. Within a week of their landing in June, the English had their first victory, when Sir Thomas Dagworth, one of Northampton's lieutenants, raided central Brittany and defeated Charles de Blois at Cadora near Jocelyn. The follow-up was less impressive. Further operations were delayed until July, when Montfort attempted to recapture of Quimper. However, news had reached the French government that Edward's main campaign had been cancelled and they were able to send reinforcements from Normandy. With his strengthened army, Charles of Blois broke the siege. Routed, Montfort fled back to Hennebon, where he fell ill and died on the 16th of September. The heir to the Montfortist cause was his five-year-old son, John. During the winter, Northampton fought a long and hard campaign with the apparent objective of seizing a harbour on the north side of the peninsula. Edward III had probably planned to land here with his main force during the summer of 1346. However, the English achieved very little for their efforts. Northern Brittany was John of Penteithra's home region and resistance was th there was very stiff. In the end, Edward decided upon Normandy as the landing spot for his 1346 campaign. Northampton was recalled and Thomas Dagworth 
was appointed as Deputy Lieutenant. It was during a tour through the English strongholds on the 9th of June that Dagworth and his escort were trapped by Charles of Blois and his army near St Paul de Lyon. They dug in on a hilltop and fought off attacks until nightfall when Charles was forced to retreat, leaving many of his wounded behind. At this point, events outside Brittany started to have an effect on the war. The French suffered a major defeat at the Battle of Crecy in 1346 and at Calais in 1347. Without French support, Charles and Bly gradually began to lose ground to the English captains. The memory of the massacre of Quimper increased its his unpopularity and Breton traders had an economic interest in strengthening links to England due to Brittany's strategic position between the Atlantic and the English Channel. At the Battle of La Roche Derrienne in 1347, when Dagworth's relief army, less than one-fourth the size of the French force, arrived at La Roche Derrienne, they attacked the eastern main encampment and fell into the trap laid by the Duke Charles. Dagworth's main force was assailed with crossbow bolts from front and rear and after a short time Dagworth himself was forced to surrender. Duke Charles, thinking he had won the battle and that Brittany was effectively his, lowered his guard. However, a sortie from the town composed mainly of townsfolk and with axes and farming implements came from behind Charles's lines. The archers and men at arms who remained from the initial assault now rallied with the town's garrison to cut down Charles' forces. Charles was forced to surrender and was taken for ransom. His strict orders to his commanders to stay in their encampments was his eventual downfall as the English forces managed to clear each encampment one by one. Charles was taken prisoner as he tried to recapture the town which had just been taken by the English. He was jailed for five years in the Tower of London. The English controlled Brest, Quimper and Vaughan. Under pressure from Pope Innocent VI, the English, French and Bretons negotiated a peace. While both factions maintained an uneasy balance of power within the duchy, it was during this period that the combats of the Thirty took place. A famous episode in medieval chivalry. Conflicts between the French and English strongholds of Jocelyn and Plouamel were resolved in a duel between thirty Montfortis knights, led by Robert Benborough, and thirty supporters of Charles de Blois led by Jean de Beaumanoir. The combat took place midway between the two towns on the 26th of March 1351. By nightfall, the Anglo-Breton Montfortists had lost nine dead against six of the pro-French knights. The surviving Montfortists were forced to surrender. Though renowned at the time and later highly romanticised, the combat had no effect on the outcome of the war. Edward III signed the Treaty of Westminster on the 1st of March 1353, accepting Charles of Blois as Duke of Brittany. If the latter undertook to pay a ransom of 300,000 crowns and that Brittany signed a Treaty of Alliance in perpetuity with England, this alliance to be sealed by the marriage of the Montfortis claimant John of Montfort, son of the earlier John of Montfort, with Edward's daughter Mary. The marriage required the approval of the King of France and a papal dispensation. Charles de la Cerda, the Constable of France, negotiated the deal, but Charles II of Navarre, who needed continuing war between England and France to maintain his own power, decided to intervene by assassinating the constable. He then switched his support to France in exchange for territory. The treaty was negated, but Charles of Blois had been freed and returned to Brittany as Duke. The situation remained in stalemate for some time, with Charles of Blois as de facto Duke. 
but with significant territory still controlled by the Montfortists. Outside events again began to have an effect on the conflict. A plague struck France and the king himself was captured by the English at the Battle of Poitiers in 1356. The French state was virtually paralysed. In 1362, when the younger John de Montfort reached 22 years of age, King Edward permitted him to return to Brittany. His return was conditioned by a covenant. The covenant not to marry without permission, giving him pledge of several fortresses. On arrival, John attempted to reach agreement with Charles of Blois to make peace and share Brittany. But Charles' wife Joan urged him to resist and to crush John. The war resumed in 1363 when Charles de Blois, assisted by Bertrand de Gouslin, had some successes. But when Bertrand left to take control of strongholds in Navarre and Normandy, Charles' advance halted at the unsuccessful siege of Becquerel. Another opportunity to negotiate an agreement arose, but again John blocked negotiations. John de Montfort moved to besiege Auré with renowned English warlord John Chandos. Charles and Bloy and Bertrand de Gouslin came to the rescue of the besieged city. Montfort, with the assistance of John Chandos, came to attack Auré, which had been in the hands of the Franco-Bretons since 1342. He entered the town of Auré and besieged the castle, which was blockaded by sea by the ships of Nicolas Bouchard coming from La Croisique. Without food supplies, the besieged agreed to surrender the place, if help did not arrive before Michaelmas, the 29th of September. Two days before, Charles de Blois had arrived east of the Abbey of Landvaux. Bertrand de Gousselin, who commanded the vanguard of the French troops, was in nearby Brandivi. On the 28th of September, de Gousselin landed on the left bank of the river and took up position before the castle. To avoid being caught between the castle and the French army, Montfort evacuated Auré and took a position facing the enemy on the slope of the right bank of the river. On the 29th of September, attempts at agreement having failed, Charles de Blois prepared for the attack. His army crossed the river and lined up facing south, considered a bad position by some of its commanders because it was on a marshy plain north of the town and castle. Montfort followed the movements and lined up facing north in a more dominating position. Rejecting the advice of de Gouslin, Charles of Blois then ordered the attack against Montfort's forces. The battle began with a short skirmish between the French armbalasters and the English archers. Then the men-at-arms engaged directly without seeking to manoeuvre. It was a bloody combat because all wanted this battle to be decisive and to put an end to the long and cruel war. Moreover, orders were given on both sides not to give quarter to captives. Each Anglo-Breton corps was attacked head on, one after the other, but the reserves restored the situation. Then the right wing of the Franco-Breton position was counter-attacked and driven back not being supported by its own reserves, was folded up towards the centre. The left wing then folded in turn. The Count of Auxerre was captured and the troops of Charles de Blois broke and fled. Charles, having been struck down by a lance, was finished off by an English soldier, obeying orders to show no quarter. De Gouchelin, having broken all his weapons, was obliged to surrender to the English commander, Chandos. De Gouchelin was taken into custody and ransomed by Charles V for 100,000 francs. The battle marked the end of this long conflict. Charles of Blois was killed and Joan of Penthrevre, finding herself a widow, saw her cause collapse. <laughs>